start my statement with a quotation of the historian Hans-Jürgen Goertz, uh, who critically asserts that sources contain no authentic factual content, but only facts as reported, selected, and handed down, often one-sided, unreliable, and manipulated, at all events already interpreted. So, unlike disciplines in the natural or in the social or technical sciences, the historical disciplines analyze the phenomena of interest retrospectively and are thus source-based in its definition. And even current approaches to analyze the digital output of a society concerning gains in knowledge, for example, are based on defined source pools, selected, analyzed, and often related to each other according to some defined criteria. In other words, all sources, regardless of type, underlie specific methods of generating new knowledge. For example, you all know this, visualization uh, projects or processing and must therefore, in any case, be handled with appropriate methodological care. So, this necessity is usually recognized with respect to traditional analog sources, for example, artifactual archives and so on. And what comes along in this context, especially art historians, work increasingly, but have done so for a long time, with reproductions. Uh, so this practice has, has its pros and cons, but one thing is for sure, the increasing usage of online sources in art historical research and teaching, and that's what I'm talking about, has obscured the fact more than ever that more than ever it is necessary to see the original object and that the present level of, it's hard to translate media enslavement, the German word would be Medienhörigkeit, uh, that this Medienhörigkeit has encouraged the unthinking use of any digital source. Unfortunately, a source found on the internet is generally believed by most of the users without further examination and without any particular critical training in handling the digital source types. One of many results of this fact is that this makes it all the easier for unvalidated sources to enter scholarly, curatorial, museological and art historical source pools and the related so-called knowledge circle. Traditional copies such as photographs or reproductions in painting of paintings in books no less than textual or audiovisual source types have mostly been subject to historically conditioned selection processes. So but even within such chains of validation, as they are called, for example, in book editing processes, or the practices, uh, many problems have appeared since digital sources entered research, teaching at universities, for example, and museological fields. Historical sources must also be trustworthy and true. And the minimal truth requirement, so to say, in our context, is not what an author, for example, pronounces to be right, but that there must be evidence of what, of his having pronounced it. Defining source studies as, on this basis, as the science of using information to elucidate an object, we can arrive at the following objective for applied scholarly source research, source criticism 
is the examination of sources with respect to their value and to their expressive power. So taking these premises at a starting point, I will now attempt a transition from traditional source studies to digital source criticism by adopting validated art historical methods of source criticism to digital media and their constitutions. For example, in setting the term of tradition of sources on an equal footing with the usage, we can also introduce the triangular relationship of work, likeness, and source into the discourse. And this was, and I will now even as Ross did uh, a little bit go into the past, this was prepared as early in 1883 by Johann Gustav Dreusen, who noted that, quote, the task of historical criticism can only be to determine in what relation the material which we intend to use historically stands to the acts of will about which it informs us. So what he means here, for example, is that not only the artists themselves or their patrons or relevant secondary sources could be used as potential sources of information, but the works of art themselves can and should also be objects of historical source studies, and this was not for sure for a long time. This implies that already for Dreisen, the work of art is nothing less than a universal historical source. So transferred to present time and given the media self-referentiality of digital sources, it is important to critically address new challenges posed by the digital uniformity of work, source, archiving, and representation. And this can be done without reinventing the methodological wheel, but by building on existing and proven methods. Um, this application of historical but still valid standards in source studies on digital media will be discussed on the basis of the di distinction already found by Dreusen between source criticism and source interpretation. I will bring this very shortly in our today's context. For example, um, Dreusen's critique of genuineness describes the validation of the digital source according to formal content parameters. The question could be, is the source still what it professes to be? So applied to digital source criticism, this analytical step corresponds to an exact examination of the origin of the source. Or the critique of the earlier and later tries to determine what alterations have taken place or have been performed uh, on the transmitted material. So this step analyzes the source according to its chronological layers. The complete spectrum of possibilities from digital manipulating with respect to digital reproduction uh, could be analyzed uh, in this step of assessment of authenticity. Or as the critique of tradition and copies uh, in German, uh, this would uh, be the Kopien critique uh, in art history. Uh, the critique of correctness tries to determine whether a source at its origin provided or could have provided what it vouches for. So this step examines the quality of truth, as mentioned at the outset, from the viewpoint of the time of its origination. 
or the analytical method discussed by Dreisen under the heading of the critical ordering of the verified materials holds for all collecting and structuring measures, databases, classifications, ontologies. Does the sum of the ordered material still contain everything in the way of testimony demanded by research? Or if it is incomplete, then to what extent? So what I want to show is that Dreusen's critique of genuineness can serve as a basis for digital source studies. So his critique could have been written also for nowadays digital source types. In particular, his critical ordering of the verified material can be applied, for example, to online databases for scholarly research. That means digital sources of, for example, artistic work or other objects can clearly be approached and of both work and source level using the proven tools of historical and art historical work and source research. For example, the so-called uh, pictorial pragmatism, uh, which is now very widely discussed in connection uh, with scholarly research into pictures, the German word would be the Bildwissenschaft, uh, is methodologically close to Joyce's pragmatic source interpretation. Now and then, it deals with the interpretation of conditions, which I will be examining more closely now, very short. According to this, the second phase uh, of source analysis includes the level of content. First, the mentioned pragmatic interpretation. This means the quality of the traditional source often suffers from the disparity between event and research, or from the material decay of the source. Generally speaking, some source types have been transformed, for example, digitized, or extracted from the production medium, for example, printed screenshots. And some sources, for example, printouts, and that's rather in interesting, have been back transformed, so re-digitized, and returned to their production medium. So this digital unification of different sources, source types, uh, calls for the interpretation of their media genesis and the inclusion of their specific source history. And the second step of source interpretation is, the, is interpreting the conditions. Quote Dreusen, uh, uh, 8083, once again, we recover a significant part of the original process when we can still demonstrate on the basis of the material the condition that shaped or contributed to shaping the process. So the documentation of digital and digitized sources is specifically derived from Dyson's argumentation because it is process oriented, oriented his dictum of the shaping of the process can likewise be applied also to our today's context. That means documenting the origin and the media transformation of the source is of greatest interest for any further historical and museological research. Regarding to this source synthetic combination of the three levels of work, representation and its source, a so-called source tradition does also exist for digital sources and must be included in reflection on terminological issues, for example. So in order to adapt those analytical methods to digital sources, the concept of cultural supplementation can be introduced. So this concept also refers to the interpretation and extrapolation of historical uh, lines implied in a source. In this case, however, the supplementations are not formal as before, but contentual. 
what this means is without any historical background knowledge, um, it would hardly be possible to identify the screen phenomenon as, for example, a work of art. And exactly at this point, learned cultural supplementation, supplementations became operant. In our today's context, the term cultural supplementation covers several aspects of different source types combined in online media. On the one hand, existing knowledge of various art subjects, for example, and on the other, several media competences for the production, the indexing, the validation, the search, and dissemination uh, of digital cultural artifacts. In particular, archives and representing institutions, museums, universities, or research institutes can tackle this challenge, introducing distinctions on the basis, for example, on, of metadata labeling and access modalities in the work and archive medium itself. For example, Renaissance artists made special models to enable their reproducers, the engravers, for example, to achieve the best faithfulness to the original. Similarly here, it is necessary to develop policies for adopting and transforming the source, as well as for the archiving and representing. What all these strategies have in common is their interest, both in work level and now increasingly uh, in the source level, which, in view of the media specific of works, documentation and source, is both justified and, of course, a methodological requirement. That means interdisciplinary settings are increasingly breaking down methodological borders and the so-called applied informatics in my case, a combination of art history and informatics is also becoming increasingly important in museological affairs. Work adequate metadata will be defined on the one hand in terms of the adaption of source interpretation already described and on the other in terms of the inclusion of technological system immanent terminologies pertaining to the presenting medium, the web. So, the problem is that particularly disciplines with a humanities bias are in danger of the so-called uh, media enslavement, media and hurricane. In contrary, the advantage of most technological sciences is founded in their discipline immanent critical approach to the media they employ. So, to end this theory chapter with Paul Feyerabend, an Austrian philosopher of science. Scientific procedures are not to be understood as closed systems. Rather than only developing hypotheses inductively, it is in certain cases better to proceed counterinductively by developing hypotheses that contradict accredited theories and even confirmed facts. That means in our context, on account of the supply of digital sources, traditional methods by no means bec become by no means uh, obsolete only because of new media, but are to be adapted to current media configurations. So to bring those theories to practice now, I will shortly show you three different source types in the field of art history dealing with the question of synchronicity of different source types in digital media. And afterwards, I will be discussing questions of synchronous archiving, collecting, or exhibiting objects which are from very different origin. So if museology is defined as an interdisciplinary field of knowledge, dealing with theoretical and practical discussions of different tasks of museums, and if you are focusing on the increasing use of digital sources, then it is useful to practically discuss those mentioned theories in fields where originals uh, have still institutional impact. 
According to this, my example is dealing with terminological problems of original copy or representation, and I will use uh, the example of born digital art, so-called net art, as a control group. Why? Because born digital web-based art is, in museological theory, the only work of art that can be archived and exhibited as original in web-based media as well. So this is the first slide from my example. The American painter Walker Evans published a well-known uh, series of photographs in 1963 portraiting poor uh, Americans. So I'm switching to the, to the next slide of my example. So this is the next slide of my example. In 1981, appropriation artist Sherry Levine got well known with her series of photographs of the photographs of Walker Evans. And as an artistic metadata in the field of appropriation art, she included the original titles of Walker Evans in her titles, and this is called After Walker Evans 4. So I'm now switching to the third slide. So this is the third slide of my example. 20 years after Sherry Levine in 2001, the American net artist Michael Mandiburg continued this concept, putting digitized versions of Levine's photographs of the Walker Evans originals on a website using Levine's titles in his titles. For example, this is called aftersherrylevine.com slash 4 JPEG, 3,250 pixel to 4,850 dpi, and so on and so on. So Mandy Berg developed the process of Levine, transforming those likenesses of Levine once again and exhibiting them as a solitary artwork on the internet. So these examples are, of course, interesting within art historical fields, but I'm mentioning them in today's context because of the impossibility of distinguishing those different source types represented via online media. And, of course, this would be a very sophisticated challenge of indexing correctly on the basis I've showed uh, in the source critical part of my speech. A database would provide three phenomenologically identical pictures synchronously, which are from totally different artistic impetus. So without specific metadata and without the cultural supplementation, I was talking about it would be rather impossible to source critically differentiate these representations. In the mentioned case of net art, the user would receive only the third picture as an original artwork, and the two others are, of course, representation of born analog artworks. And those media conditions would have to be recognized when indexing these different source types. So based on the mentioned media unity of work, likeness, and source born digital art is therefore convenient for analyzing every other type of source. In contrary to digitized art, net art does not leave its medium of production and constitute a not known unity of production, archiving, and representation of digital networks. So um, based, of this, based on this argument, some problems concerning providing synchronous archives of existing analog collections and their equivalents may occur understandable now. Continuing my example, I want to show a search result from the well-known and well-maintained picture Pool Prometheus uh, from the University of Cologne. Um, the reason of using for this example this metadatabase is it's compared to others rather good source quality in the field of art history and the conclusion on source qualities uh, of other providers who are not able to maintain its sources that way. What you can see on the screen 
are two search results which are appearing rather similar, but which are very different from its origin. The very well-known young hair from Albrecht Dürer and the even well-known cathedral from Rouen, I don't know if you can see this, from Claude Monet. So both searches reveal similar reproductions because both reproduction uh, series are very different concerning, for example, the colors. I hope you can see the different colors of the reproductions. But in case of Dürer, those reproductions are based, in theory, of course, uh, on one original painting. And in case of Monet, those different colors are intended by the artists. If the user does not know those facts, and that's, that's what I've called the cultural supplementations, two interesting conclusions could be made. On the one hand, Dürer could have been made several different colored hairs, as you can see here. Or, on the other hand, Monet's paintings are badly digitized, and the bad digitizing is the reason for the different color versions. As you all know, it's exactly the other way around. There's only one young hair in the Albertina in Vienna, and there are 33 different paintings uh, in different museums all over the world uh, showing the Cathedral of Rouen at different times of day, and that's the only reason for the different colors. Comparing those examples with the Walker Evans trilogy shows that there are different types of synchrony strongly asking for quality in providing those reproductions and, on the other hand, uh, in evaluating the search results concerning their scientific usability. That means we are in need of a scientifically valid providing of sources by the providing institutions, and we are in need of source competent users. Because of the fact that something will appear on the screen when you are searching, to recognize and to evaluate what is on the screen will be the user-sided key competence of the future. So if we are talking about, for example, synchrony of archives and its relevance for digital source criticism, one could ask about object and art fitting representations representation because we cannot present something in the internet except net art in a museological meaning. In this sense, digitized objects could be called semiophores, as Christoph Bamiok does in sin, uh, um, doing this. They have to be treated within their role as signs or symbols. Or we are treating those digital representations as pointers uh, on their analog equivalence, revealing the possibilities of watching these artworks in the museums where they are shown without any media transformation, or to avoid the risk of alibi objects as reproductions and replicas are called by Chantal Martinet, a first step would be the precise acknowledgement of different source types and their origins, not in a non-productive, ludistic way, so all machines are bad, but with media and source-based competence, dealing with changing definitions of sources and as well changing definitions of museums, just shown exemplarily with Walker Evans, Dürer or Monet. So, to end with a practical summary, I would like to support the cooperative development of a, so to say, digital museology maybe, like it is already realized in many specialized fields of humanities in case of applied informatics to find a non-hierarchical way 
of combining proven and adapted methods of humanities, for example, this shown source criticism, with museological theories of collecting, archiving, and exhibiting cultural artifacts 